know, I've been bringing up these apologetics topics and apologetics being defending the faith. And our faith is under attack from all angles, okay? We have, you know, he did an extensive study um, on Sunday about what is truth. Truth is under attack. We live now in what's called a postmodernist society where truth is uh, relative. Um, and we're seeing the effects of that throughout our society and our justice systems. And, but anyway, again, that's a whole study in and of itself. But another area that attacks our faith is science. And it seems to conflict with the word of God. And we're constantly told that science has proved that the Bible is wrong. <coughs> and that even Stephen Hawking, the renowned astrophysicist, um, had come out, I think it was in, uh, one of his last books that he published had to do with, you know, that we, science pretty much proved that there's no need to even go down that path, that, that we know enough about how the universe got started is that, and that we don't need to believe in God. Carl Sagan really was the one that popularized that through his show, The Cosmos, his book and his show, TV show. I don't know if some of you are old enough, I know, to have seen that. <laughs> I'm not the only one. Uh, he has since passed away and now knows the truth. Um, but anyway, I wanted to hit once again, you're going to get the impression that Romans 1 is one of my favorite <coughs> chapters, particularly verses 18 and on. But let me read to you just Romans chapter 1, verse 20. It says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So I did this message, I think it was the Sunday that Reuben was gone, called um, No Excuses. And, um, but I wanted to take a minute, you know, because this is kind of science stuff, and I know not everybody's into science. I mean, like, if you were going to do something on math, I'd probably, like, uh, <laughs> math is not my strong suit. Um, and there's probably other things as well, I'm sure. But um, it just makes me think of, like, over in Matthew, Matthew 24, when the disciples had asked, Jesus, you know, so what are the signs of the end? What's going to happen? And so he goes on to describe, and then at the, towards the end of that, he says, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christ, false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Now, I don't want that to happen to anybody here. So part of the reason I bring up these apologetics things is to equip you so that you can have confidence. I don't expect you to go out after this and encounter somebody, you know, an atheist, and then start, you know, talking about intelligent design. But what I want is that if somebody, you watch on a TV show and the, and the gist of that show is that science has proved the Bible wrong, I want you to be able to be confident in knowing that it's not true. It's part of these deceptions. God is the only creator, but the devil is a counterfeiter and a liar. And he takes the creation and turns it into evolution. Whatever God does in his creation, it seems like Satan's there to counterfeit it and make it something else, something more pleasing to our more purient interests, our, our sinful natures. Anyway, so there are scientists who are Christians. They're not contradictory. I, I based the 
there's a couple books if you, if you have any interest. But William Dembski, and this is kind of a collection of, of uh, essays concerning intelligent design. But um, let me just read a little bit about William Dembski, because this is primarily his material. Um, he holds a PhD in mathematics from the University of Chicago, a PhD in philosophy from the University of Illinois at Chicago. He also has earned degrees in theology and psychology. He is um, a recipient of two fellowships from the National Science Foundation and currently a senior fellow of the Discovery Institute Center for Renewal of Science and Culture. He has done postdoctoral work at the University of Chicago, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Princeton University, Northwestern University, and Dembski has written numerous scholarly articles and is the author of uh, critically acclaimed The Design Inference. So, impressive, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, credentials that we can look at and say, gee, you know, I thought, you know, why would, Chris, why would somebody like this do I mean, wasn't in all that science that he studied, wasn't he convinced of the, of the materialist point of view of evolution and that there is no God? Well, obviously not. So what we want to do, and I'm going to kind of follow his train of thought with this, is that uh, because actually intelligent design is a bit of a controversial subject uh, not just from the uh, people who are the Darwinists, but there are certain churches, evangelical even, that don't like intelligent design. So the Darwinist doesn't like it because they think you're trying to trying to uh, camouflage God and bring him into the realm of science. And there are certain churches or um, people that I even like and respect and even get some of their literature who think that intelligent design is watering down the gospel, watering down creation to try and make it more palpable to people um, instead of being staying strictly to the word. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, well, it's broken down into three sections, what it isn't, what it is, and what it will be. So what, it's important that we talk about what intelligent design isn't. So first of all, we're going to talk about, let's put them all there. Well, that's funny, it worked differently on your computer, huh? Um, so first of all, it's not optimal design. It is not apparent design, those are two distinct things, and it's not religiously motivated, and it's not a mechanism or magic. Now, we'll get into all of these things so that you'll see what I'm talking about and why those are important distinctions. But, um, so intelligent design does not imply that it's optimal design. Just because something's intelligently designed does not necessarily mean it's perfect, okay? What we're ultimately trying to get to is how can, how do we know when something is been developed by an intelligent source, okay? So that's what this is about, is providing some kind of criteria within science where when we look at the evidence, we can say, wow, this didn't just happen by chance. So what's that criteria? How do we know that? Okay. So first thing is to make the distinction between optimal design and apparent design. Optimal design implies that it's perfect. And apparent design is something that could have happened by accident. Looks like it might have been designed, but not really. It's really chance that caused it. It just happened to take a shape that's kind of similar to something that looks like it could have been designed. And it's not religiously motivated. This, when we talk about it, this eliminates the issue with people who 
from the Christian side of things that object to it. And then um, it's not a mechanism or magic, uh, some kind of uh, trickery. When in regard to optimal design, I, I'm a computer analyst, uh, programmer analyst, and we have clients that will say, okay, we've got this system that, you know, uh, where we, we do our business, but it's all paper driven. We need a computer system that's going to help us do this um, more efficiently. So we go down and we sit down with them and we analyze. We go through all their business functions. We find out what they do, how they do it, when they do it. Where does this information come from? Where does this information go? What do you want to see come out of this? What kind of reports? What kind of you know, data? So we go through all this and then we build essentially a document that says, okay, this is what we think you want, okay, and so on and so forth. But in any project, because I've, I've managed some projects, and in project management, one of the key things is to manage customer expectations. A lot of people think that they're going to get an optimal system. It's going to have everything they want, okay? So we design this system for them, but then we have to tell them, Okay, there's things that are going to impact this. How soon do you want it? How much money do you have? And then there's a question of resources, people that can be dedicated to working on this project. So this whole thing with optimal design, all of a sudden reality slips in. So what we do is, and I've actually drawn this out for some of the more difficult ones, but uh, we try and explain. These are your options. Pick two. Okay? If you want your project, if you want the product to be good and fast, it's not going to be cheap. If you want it to be cheap and good, it won't be very fast. You see where I'm going? If you want it fast and cheap, it's not going to be very good. Does that make sense? I mean, you have to give up something. We don't live in a perfect world. Okay? If you want it good and fast, it's going to take a lot of money because I'm going to have to put a lot of resources on it. Okay? We're going to work overtime. So it's going to be expensive. If it's good and cheap, it's not going to be fast because I can't put more resources. I can't add overtime. So it's going to take longer. So you see how that goes. So we don't live in an optimal world. But does that mean that the product, because it's not all three of these things, does that mean it's not intelligently designed? Well, um, maybe some of my customers would have said, <laughs> no, not really. Um, so intelligent design does not, does not imply um, impar uh, apparent design, where it's uh, so, I'm sorry, I skipped over a, the last uh, thing on the other slide was, um, let me go back. The preview. Oh, yeah, the whole thing got skipped. No, I'm back on the same one. Oh, well. So anyway, that whole thing with the triangle, we call that constrained optimization. <laughs> it's like you want to build this very good system, but we're constrained by reality. Okay? I have a lot of problem with uh, we get um, kids right out of college or something, and they've learned all their programming classes, and you know they go through and they have specific little examples, or big examples. I mean, some of them are it's intense in school. But they're taught a certain way to do something, and that this is the right way to do that. And then you bring them into this environment, and you say, okay, we got, okay, the customer wants this, uh, so we're going to have to phase this in. We're going to do it by sections. We're going to have to cut this out. And, well, that's not the way to do it. You really need to do this. And, 
and we should code it this way. And you go, well, yeah, in a perfect world, but we're not in a perfect world. And if you, unless you want to work for free, then we're going to do it this way. So um, that's what we deal with. So then we're going to talk about apparent design. This is what the, the uh, Darwinists like to, to throw at us is that um, intelligent, um, an intelligent agent can act stupidly or skillfully or masterfully. It doesn't matter. So um, they like to uh, confuse, use this confusion to argue evolution against design. Obviously not perfect, so God, so it didn't come from God. So that's their argument is that um, because creation isn't perfect, it doesn't really come from God. And then this gets into that whole, uh, like we did the, the problem of evil before, is that, well, how can there be so much evil if, there, if God's perfect in all of this? So uh, it's the same kind of thing. It goes down that road. They try and detract from what it really is. It's a... Uh, They try and change it into an argument about philosophy and religion. Very skillfully, Dawkins and those guys do that all the time. They try and make it not about science. So, so it's not religiously motivated. Um, ideas, a sci uh, intelligent design is scientifically unobjectionable. It sets up a set of criteria for determining intelligent design. It does not speculate about the nature of the designing intelligence. We don't care. I mean, they, it could be skillfully, masterfully done. It might be somebody stupid that did something, but it still exhibits um, intelligence. And then it's not a mechanism or magic not introducing any kind of superstition or, or uh, mystical things that you have to agree to. Let's go on to, uh, okay. Intelligent design is basically, what is it trying to say? It says, did it, did it have to happen? Did it happen by accident? Did an intelligent agent cause it to happen? We all watch the CSI shows, and they go in, and there's a dead body on the floor. So what is it they try and determine? Okay. Was it suicide? Was it an accident? Was it murder? How they, if it was an accident, then it was just by chance. The guy tripped over something, hit his head on a table, he's dead. Okay. Was it on purpose, suicide? Then it's by necessity or, you know, but intelligently designed, intelligent design is involved because they set up the situation in which to take their lives. Was it murder? Again, you look for evidence of intelligent design. The kinds of evidence that you would see that leads you to think somebody else was in the room and somebody else did this. He was shot, there's no gun in here, okay? Uh, the guy never owned a gun, so on and so forth. Fingerprints of another person. We know somebody else was in here. So that's what we look for in science when we're looking for evidence of intelligent design. So okay, it's an age-old question. Uh, we won't go into too much into this, but it goes back to the Greeks and even before. Um, throughout history, there's been the, it's wavered back before, you know, our origins, how we got here, what God was talking about. The evidence for me is there, okay? But it's gone back and forth. The Greeks, the Stoics, and the Epicureans, the various schools of philosophy, some would say it's 
by chance, some would say it's by design, some would say by necessity. It's just the way the laws of nature just cause it, it had to be that way. So like if you have a, a glass of water, salt water, and you set it on out in the sun, the water evaporates off, you're going to wind up with salt crystals in the bottom. It's by necessity, that's laws of chemistry and physics, okay? But ID, uh, intelligent design, studies the effects of intelligent causes. Intelligent design does not try to get into the head of the designing intelligence. Rather, it looks at what uh, the designing intelligent does and draws inferences from that. So what we can see is, again, it's not trying to get into the head of the designer because then we're getting into philosophy and religion and all that. Who is the designer? That's not what this is trying to ask. What it's trying to say is, what we see around us, was it designed or is it a product of chance? It's as simple as that. So, um, we have various industries that use this, these concepts. Forensic science, we were just talking about these crime scene investigators. Intelligent property law. Uh, how do you determine plagiarism? When somebody says, it was just in the news, right? There's two um, current artists who were accused of uh, ripping off an old Marvin Gaye song. And so this is a type of, of um, stealing of intellectual property or plagiarism. And so they went to court. Well, you can bet that in the, the prosecuting uh, side, prosecution side, was presenting how do we know? What kind of evidence do we know? So it was looking for intelligent design, designing intelligence. Um, insurance claims investigations, crypt cryptography. In other words, how do they break codes? Um, random number generation. Well, that's kind of interesting because there really is no such thing as random numbers. Um, but the uh, Rand Corporation one time, which is a, uh, well, they're like a think tank in a, and they're very highly involved in high-end science, um, developed a book for engineers called One Million Random Numbers. And it sounds, uh, Chuck Missler talked about this in one of his talks. <laughs> it sounds funny, but it's like you really can't come up with randomness in this universe. That's part of one of the problems with uh, chance, a universe created by chance. And then there's um, the CD project, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Have you guys ever heard of that? They actually, like at Goldstone, I think is one of the places, they have these radio telescopes. Like, you see that faint design in the back with the, like the satellite screen, the radio telescope. They have these all over the world and they're pointed to outer space and they're just listening for intelligent life. And we're going to talk about that in a second, about what, what they're actually listening for. But there was a movie called Contact with Jodie Foster, I think, in it, that dealt with that CD project. And that was actually based on a book written by Carl Sagan. And um, on one hand, I'd recommend seeing it. It was kind of interesting. On the other hand, there's two warnings. One, there is a little bit of um, intimacy. <laughs> that had really no reason to be there, but of course that's Hollywood that has to be there, part of their criteria. And uh, also the, the bad guy in this movie is this whacked out weird evangelical Christian guy, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that had to be there too, in Hollywood. But other than that, it's, it presents some interesting questions. Um, so, Basically, that we're down to, okay, so what's the problem with having, um, if we can set up some criteria for intelligent design, um, what, would that what would that be? How do we know something's by chance or something's by intelligent design? So what William Densky came up with is this three basic criteria. Now, this is where it gets, I really struggle with this part because... Uh, 
as I showed you the books, it's very, very detailed, but he really breaks it down into three criteria. And each one of those gets kind of hard to explain, but let me get there. Um, okay, one, what they call contingency, and there's blind and directed contingency. But basically that's, um, did it have to happen? So if it, if it didn't have to happen, and it did, then that implies something caused it to happen. And then you have complexity. And complexity deals more with probabilities. Contingency is more like, um, well, he used the term irreducibility. So go back to contingency. I spill some ink on paper. And what I get there is a result of what happens when ink spills on paper. I mean, that, I'm sorry. That's the properties of ink and paper, okay? Whatever happened, that's reducible to that, okay? When I hold up this, well, that's ink and paper, but what I'm seeing there isn't a result of just the pure physics of ink on paper. There's a specific pattern, design, whatever there, that I can't reduce that any farther down to just what happens when ink falls on paper. So it's irreducible. It, it's... It kind of, you look at it and you go, whoa, 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 that didn't just happen by accident, okay? Complexity is more like um, probabilities. What's the chances of that happening? So, you know, those Rorschach tests in psychology, they have those ink blot tests where they have these, where, you, you know, they open them and say, what does that look like to you? And it looks like a butterfly, you know? Um, well, what does that exhibit? How did that, those originally get created? Now it's almost like they, they print them that way, I guess. It's all the same for everybody. But those would be kind of like, well, I don't know. You know, It could be this, could be that. So it still leaves you in the dark a little bit about whether that was designed that way or whether it was actually, um, what's the probabilities that that sort of looks like a butterfly what are the probabilities that ink falling on paper would actually look like that? And specification means it fits a pattern. So if you have a pattern that what you're looking at is something that couldn't just happen by accident, the probability of it happening isn't very good, and it actually fits a known pattern that we have. Okay, so that's where we come into... Um, in the movie... Contact, they're listening into outer space, okay? So that they hear, you know, there's noises out there. Pulsars and stuff create radio signals. And so there's all kinds of radio signals out there. How do you know something's intelligent? And this is what's so funny is, on the one hand, they're telling us all of Earth, everything on it, DNA, all happened by chance. But when they're listening out into space, if they hear beep, 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 now that doesn't mean anything. But what they got in, in the movie Contact was this. Ones and zeros. The ones imply like a beep, a zero is a space, okay, or a pause. But what that turned out, so in their computers, they have known patterns that they, anything that comes in goes through and the computer compares it to all these known types of patterns. Well, what this was, was prime numbers from 2 to 121, I think it was. And then, of course, the movie goes on because then there was sub wavelengths. That was sort of like the, you've got mail. <laughs> that got their attention. Then when they started analyzing the signal, they found more stuff. But anyway, so... But what made that send a signal to them? So those three things are the pattern in specific in um, almost looks like I skipped something here. 
Oh, yeah, it kind of. So complexity, okay, I talked about how complexity is like a probability and, it, uh, and contingency is the um, irreducibility of, of those things. And then specificity or specification is the pattern that we're comparing to. And it's usually a known pattern that we have. So if you see a bunch of letters just out there and you wouldn't know, it's like that doesn't mean anything. There's no specificity. Those are just kind of random numbers out there. They might be a complex a whole bunch, like the letter A alone, not very complex. Very specific because it does fit a pattern that we have of an alphabet. There's a letter A, but it doesn't tell us anything. But then if you have several letters that fit, it's a little more complex, specified, but then it goes on and on. So you, then if you get Shakespeare's sonnet, then you have something that's definitely intelligently designed. So he comes down to finally get to the, the gist of it, it's just getting. So this is how they determine it. So this is just a, what they call a fil explanatory filter or a flow chart we would use in programming. So you start, well, is the event contingent? If it is, then you check for complexity. And if it is, then if it's, uh, if there's specification, then it's, Designed. So that's how we know. So now if we apply that to what we see around us, what do we wind up with? We can't help but come to the conclusion that um, that where, where we are, it's designed. You can't, let's say uh, Pastor Ruben says we're going to have a men's retreat. It's going to be up in the mountains. And uh, Roman and I are going to go up early. We kind of know where this place is, but we can't remember. There's this fork in the road. And when you get to that fork in the road, I, I don't remember which way to go. So we're going to go up the night before, the day before, and we're going to find this place. Uh, and when you guys, you know, get to this trail and you go up, you'll come to the fork in the road. Uh, we'll leave something there so you'll know which way to go. So we all come up the next day and we hike up. And on one side, there's like uh, a little rock slide, and there's rocks laid out, and maybe a swirl that kind of points in that direction. But on this side, there's rocks that are laid out one after another with like an arrow on the end. Okay, so which way are we going to go? Well, this doesn't, it's kind of complex, but it could be the result of just rocks falling down, right? And there's no known, known pattern that it fits or anything. So this is not intelligently designed. This is intelligently designed. And so that's the path we're going to go. That's really what we're just talking about here. But let's say that we have, uh, we're bringing along a guy who's an atheist, uh, a biologist. And all of a sudden this lizard crawls up on this rock. And, and we're all sitting there going, oh, well, this is obviously the way to go because those rocks are laid out on arrow. It's obviously intelligently designed. And then the lizard crawls up there and the biologist goes, you know, that lizard uh, is a descendant of an amphibian who is a descendant of a fish who is a descendant of a, uh, a worm who is a descendant of a sponge who is a descendant of a single cell that happened by chance. All happened by chance. What? <laughs> Have you ever looked inside that lizard? I mean, you've got multiple complex systems that are functioning together and then you go down to the cell level where the DNA and the code that's on the DNA, that doesn't happen by chance. Come on. If we use this criteria, it doesn't work. You can't get there that way. So in this case, you know, he's, he says that, you know, intelligent design opens up new avenues of scientific discovery. Because why? Because you'd be allowed to look wherever the evidence takes you. Right now, with Darwinistic materialist science, if it ain't Darwin, it ain't right. I don't care what your, what your, what your evidence is. If it doesn't fit the Darwinist model, it isn't correct. This opens it up. And then um, he said that growing acceptance to teach controversy in schools, well, that really hasn't 
panned out is that the um, the power to to combat that is intense and growing public awareness of the weakness of evolutionary theory, which is what I'm trying to get across, and then the growing acceptance of modern intelligence design theory. Um, I think the problem is, like I'm having here today, it's not very interesting and people, you know, it's, you know, it's hard to understand in a sense. But my point is that it's encouragement for you to know that there is a reason that we can say that creation is the much better explanation. Okay, but remember, this is a scientific theory, intelligent design. It says, when I look at the DNA molecule, the cell, and life, all the systems, I see, based on those criteria, that it's intelligently designed. Who designed it? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm just saying, this is where I don't understand the argument of the Christians because this is a scientific theory. It's not talking about who the, who the designer is. It's just saying from a scientific standpoint, it gets us to that point where we can say it's designed. Now we step in and say, I know the answer to that. So that's the important thing about this whole thing. It's not that you learn all of that, which I was saying poorly, <laughs> I admit. But it's, it's just so that we know that there is a way to tell something is intelligently designed or not. And what we see around us, what God was saying in chapter 20, where it's all around us. Let me read it again. For since the creation of the, world, of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Why is it clearly seen? Because it's obviously it's been designed. So, so we as Christians can take away from this is that we can trust the word of God. And that when people say that the word of God and science don't blend, that's not true. And I love to see it when, because I have a science and technical background, and I love to see it when, the, when I learn stuff like this. It just, I just get excited because it's like the word of God from the beginning has been telling us the way it is. And then I get people that say, well, aren't you worried about, like that, the, they built this hydron collider, which it's this giant 17-mile loop and it's this uh, device where they can shoot an electron out this way and an electron out this way. It travels at just about the speed of light, and then they collide. And what they're trying to do is find out all these subatomic particles. And they're looking for what they call the God particle. Maybe you guys have heard about this, but the Higgs boson, the God particle, because they say there's all these forces that that we have in the universe are four basic forces, but there's got to be something that holds it all together. We know what it is. <laughs> God says he's the one that's holding it all together and that they're looking for the God particle, they call it, the one particle that holds it all together. I'm like excited. When somebody says, are you worried about what they're going to find? I go, worried? I'm excited because <laughs> what they're going to find is going to blow you away if they're even able to find it. I mean, science is a friend to the word of God, not an enemy. I mean, genetics started really full-blown in the 50s. What does genetics tell us? Genetics says stasis. Stasis means every kind pr produces its own kind. Wow, that was in the Bible, wasn't it? <laughs> it's like, it doesn't tell us that things evolve. Mutations are mostly, 90-some percent of them are bad, and the rest are of no effect. What about biochemistry? Biochemistry has taken us into the inner workings of the cell and DNA and how proteins are produced. And we find out it's way too complicated to ever have happened by chance or even necessity. Information theory, where does the information come from that's on the DNA? It can only... 
I've never seen a program, computer program in my life that happened by itself. It always takes a programmer. You can't have code. There's no code on Earth that comes anywhere near the code that's in the DNA molecule. And yet that happened by chance, but everything else was designed. So I say bring it on. But here's the thing. Good science, not bad science. Good science, follow the evidence wherever it takes you. Bad science starts with the presupposition. There is no God. And when you start with that, then you have to start eliminating evidence. Anthony Flew was a, um, a British professor, doctor, atheist guy. And uh, pretty dedicated to that. But he had this going for him. He said, follow the evidence. He says you should firmly hold on to your atheism unless the evidence takes you elsewhere. He wound up becoming a theist. I don't know that he ever became a Christian, but he wound up becoming a theist. He finally said the evidence is too great, so he believed in an intelligent designer. And he even wrote a book about that, his conversion to theism. And everybody tried to poo-poo it because it was written while well, he was old when he wrote it and he probably wasn't thinking straight. And, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and he refuted that. Um, but that's the thing. The word of God and science, hand in hand. But we have no reason to fear it. We have no reason to fall for the lies and deceptions that we hear in the media, on Nova, <laughs> everywhere else that you get that. It's amazing. There is, we can know. We can know. Anyway, sorry, it's kind of a dull topic in, in the beginning, but I think I was kind of hoping you'd hang on to the end and see that this is just another one. Again, does this prove the existence of God? Does the anthropic principle I tell you prove it? Does the problem of evil prove it? No, but we're starting to see an accumulation of evidences which makes it very hard to deny that there is a God. And then we step in and share that with people and we can tell them who he is. Like Paul, when he went up on Mars Hill, he says, you had that tomb out there to the unknown God. I know him. I'm here to tell you about him. And that's our role.